I'm Elaine Arnold, a member of Unity. Welcome to Unity of the Hill Country, where we offer a positive path for spiritual living. The Daily Word has been giving the worldwide unity movement a daily prayer since July 1924. Today's reader, can you guess, is my mama, Robin Stewart. Morning, you all. <laughs> I'm so glad to be back. I'm so glad to see all these happy faces, faces sitting around. Yes, look at those grins. <laughs> I have to tell you, as a divine being, I am whole. Repeat that. As a divine being, I am whole and perfect. I know I'm whole, wondrously made and unique expression of the divine. But I cannot truly know wholeness if I become distracted by an experience of illness or thoughts or lack of limit and limitation. Can't do that. Got to go the different way. I do not resist limiting thoughts. Instead, I let the light of divine understanding dissolve the darkness of the spiritual ignorance. Remember that remembering that divine life lives as me, I affirm my body's wholeness even if I'm experiencing illness. 
we aren't really experiencing it. We just think we are. It isn't really there. Um, growing awareness of the limitless flow of divine ideas reminds me I have all I need to experience a joyous, abundant life. As I say yes again and again to my true spiritual nature, my life becomes an ever-enfolding demonstration of wholeness. And from Luke 11:36, if then your whole body is full of light with no part of it in darkness, it will be as full of light as when a lamp gives you light with its rays. Bless you all. The Unity Movement started in 1889 with answered prayer. Myrtle Fillmore was healed of tuberculosis. We'll be honored to pray with you. You can request prayer at b.unity.org. You can also place a prayer request in our lobby prayer box or online at unityhillcountry.org and click on the Ministries tab. Please take a moment now to silence your phone so it doesn't disturb our gathering. Please join me in affirming our mission and vision statements. To live consciously, celebrating the divine potential in all. As well as Unity's statement of faith, there is only one presence and one power active in my life and in the universe. God, the good, the omnipotent. And today I get the pleasure of introducing our our guest minister, um, Reverend Jeannie Brocious King. Jeannie King served as senior minister for eight years at Unity of Richardson, Texas. She is a well-known Unity speaker and seminar leader, life coach, author, and host of the Coffee Chat podcast for the beautiful network of women. Be Now offers weekend retreats for women, the next one of which is scheduled for September 19th through 22nd. Jeannie teaches Clutter Clearing for Love, Joy, Health, and Abundance. Clutter Clearing for Churches, The Money Game, Creating Your Vision, and a 12-week The Artist's Way to Excavate Your Creativity. Jeannie and her husband, Dr. Joe King, live in Junction, Texas, where Joe has a veterinary clinic and kennel. They have renovated their former winery and bistro and now live in downtown Junction with their two dogs. Jeannie and her husband, Dr. Joe King, live in Junction. Whoop. It, that's been repeated. Yep, yep. <laughs> it's been repeated down there, so whoops. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Reverend Jeannie. Okay. so grateful for all that I have. I am so blessed. I am so blessed. I am so grateful. I am so blessed. I am so blessed. I am so blessed. I am so grateful. I am 
Beautiful. So let's go into meditation for a moment. Just settle yourself in. Make sure that your back is supported by the chair. Put your feet on the floor if it sounds, if it feels good to you. Remove everything from your lap except your hands and just be fully present here. Let's just take in a deep breath. Breathe in. Ah, and breathe out. As a reminder, the very air in this room is charged with God energy. So let's just breathe in that God energy. Breathe it in. And let go of anything that you have to do later, anything that's on your mind, or anything that can be taken care of later. Just be fully present here in this room. And I invite you to set your intentions for what you would like to come away with after this service today. Just take in a deep breath. We are indeed so blessed. We are so grateful to be here together. We are so grateful to know that we are surrounded with other loving intentions people who are watching online, people who are, who are here within the sanctuary, we just invite you to be aware of the energy running through your body, running through your mind that keeps your heart pumping. Be present. As Ram Dass said, be here now in this moment, in this holy moment, where the ground on which we stand and sit and walk is holy ground. Always loving God, we invite you to access our hearts and our minds that we may hear and understand that which is said and which happens for us today. I'd like for you to expand your mind and your heart out into this room and know that we all come here with our own lives and our own friends and relatives and we send those blessings out to everyone. We send it out to the city of Kerrville, to people who are alone and who are feeling sad. We ask, believing, that a spark of light, that somebody will smile at them, somebody will say something that will remind them who they really are. We send this out across the state of Texas, across the United States, and across this world. We are all divine expressions of God. We are children of God. We ask today that we be a difference and that we make a difference 
and we don't have to know how that is. In this moment, just feel the joy welling up within you. Feel that life force. God is and I am. Breathe it in. God is and I am. Breathe it out. And we are grateful. Bring your awareness back into this room, if you will. Open your eyes. And be fully present. Thank you. So I'm so happy that you heeded the call to be here today. Whether you're tuned in on Facebook or YouTube or you're sitting here, my deal with God is I'll show up, but you just send whoever needs to be here. I know someone said, oh, Jeannie King, you're speaking today. I went, I am? <laughs> just kidding. I knew that. <laughs> so our discussion today asks the question, was Jesus poor? And I love the daily word because you were reading with such enthusiasm and talking about the abundance of life and the allness of, of God and the source energy that runs through us. Jesus ran into his own problems. You know, the Pharisees had a problem with Jesus. Why? Because he was telling them, you are part of God, and you can go directly to the source, and you can be, do, and have anything you want. Well, that didn't fly. They didn't like that much. But and when, when people said that he was the king of the Jews, and they asked him about it, he said, well, I knew Abraham before I was born. Well, they picked up stones. They wanted to stone him to death because, you know, they weren't going to have that kind of mess. But most people and most religions have been taught or teach that Jesus was poverty stricken and that there is something great and wonderful about being poor. And that's a lie. There is nothing to be aspiring to, to be poor. I shared this upcoming talk on several of my Facebook pages and told them what I was going to be talking about. And most people were like very excited. And I had a couple of people who kind of came after me going, well, I don't like that prosperity gospel. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I don't, you know, it's, it's much bigger than that. Prosperity is not just money. It's health. It's freedom. It's the enjoyment of life. It's the joy and the love that we have. My husband and I have a morning prayer service and a meditation, and we have a list of people that we pray for, and we call out their names. And we feel like that is prosperity and abundance by holding people up. Jesus knew that a rising tide lifts all boats. He wasn't judging people. He wasn't pointing fingers at people. He said, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and love your neighbor as yourself. And that's a little bit more difficult sometimes. <laughs> but one thing that is consistent with most people is that we understand that money struggles are not fun. Health struggles are not fun. And, you know, I, I told you last week that I went through a whole year of, uh, of illness and, you know, I was never sick. And I went through all of this surgery and, you know, the greatest thing. In fact, see me later if you want to take part in this. Because what I realized that when they took out and they, like, vacuumed out my whole uh, abdomen from diverticulitis, that there were organs in my body that were holding in pain and fear and judgment and all kinds of emotional stuff. Who knew? And I'm different. I am changed. I'm a different person, and it's a good thing. But I'm writing a book about people who have lost body parts. Some people I know have, have donated kidneys to other people. Other people have lost other body parts, and it changes you. And the name of my book, and I'm, I, if you have had that experience, come see me because I want to get your little story for my book. But uh, this, the name of my book comes from a, an Eric Butterworth story. Reverend Eric Butterworth, you may know, was the big unity minister. He was in 
uh, New York City. He was in Manhattan. And he and his wife had a big apartment in downtown Manhattan. It was a big, big place. And one time when he and his wife were getting ready, I'm going to turn that off. Am I getting feedback? No? OK, you're good. OK, thanks. Um, they were getting ready to go to Europe for weeks. And they had their maid. And she got sick right before they left. And he was like, are you going to be OK? She, oh, yeah, I'm going to be OK. And he said, well, here, let me help you. And he wrote out this big couple of paragraphs of these affirmations, you know, you know these real big unaffirmations, these big flowery things. And he said, I want you to do this. Read these out loud a couple times a day, and I think it'll help you. And she said, OK, that's fine. They came back several weeks later, and he said, how are you feeling? And she said, I feel great. He said, I am so happy that I could participate in your healing. And she said, well, you know, Dr. Butterworth, I got to tell you the truth. The minute you and Mrs. left, I lost that piece of paper. <laughs> I looked high. I looked low. It was nowhere. And I couldn't remember anything that was on it. So I just walked around the apartment saying, oh, hell, I'm well. <laughs> That's the name of my book. <laughs> oh, hell, I'm well. <laughs> Isn't that a great affirmation? <laughs> And that's another form of abundance. <laughs> but how many people here have ever said or thought, if I could only win the lottery, I'd be the exception to the rule. I'd be good. I'd, I'd use it, right? If I could only win the lottery, I'd do this, I'd do that, whatever. OK. I, I don't have any problem with that. But we also say things that are counterproductive. We understand that we or we think we understand that we're living under this lack and limitation. And we say, if I, could, if I had enough money, I'd buy a new car. I'd send my grandkids to, to college. You know, I would do this. I would go on vacation. You know, I would do all of these things. But the underlying belief is that we are, you know, the lack of funds is a real impediment. Now, Charles Fillmore, who was the co-founder of Unity, shocked the religious establishment when he said, it is a sin to be poor. What? I don't know if you know this story about Charles and Myrtle Fillmore, but they were poverty stricken. She not only had tuberculosis, she had malaria. I don't know if she got malaria. Charles had fallen with an ice skating uh, accident and his hip was, was frozen. He was trying to uh, sell insurance. He was not successful. He was an agnostic. He didn't believe in all that stuff. And she went, Myrtle went to a, a talk one night, and this man electrified her. He said, I am a child of God, and therefore I do not inherit sickness. That went in deep with her. So she came back, and she started reading the Bible and saying, did this stuff just happen like 2,000 years ago? Is this still true? And she said, yeah, it's true. So she started studying, and people started coming to their house. They were so poor, and she was so sick, uh, that they had to have her mom live with them to take care of the kids. Well, she immediately started getting better. So Charles wasn't going to be left out. You know, if she can do it, I can do it better. And, uh, <laughs> and he started studying, too, and he healed his hip. And this was the beginning of unity. It was a healing ministry. And they began to get wealthy. And, you know, just, and I, I don't mean overnight. It's not a lottery thing. You know, they were helping other people. They were being a difference. They were making a difference. And it changed their lives. So when he said it is a sin to be poor, he knew what poor was. And he also knew that poverty is a, and it isn't that, you know, we can be born into poverty. I was born into a poor family. I was the second oldest of six children. My dad worked like crazy. My mom raised the kids. And, you know, it was, we never missed a meal, but we were not wealthy, believe me. But he was talking about accessing. You know, you don't have to stay poor. You can pull yourself into that God flow and access all of the abundance that God has for you. Many people think that sin is in a religious context, like you know, doing something evil in the Ten Commandments you know, tells you not to do it. But if you go back to the Aramaic, it actually means, it's an archery term, it means to, hit, to 
aim for the target, and miss it, to miss the mark. That was sin. If you go into a more metaphysical thing, A Course in Miracles says this, sin is nothing but a lack of love. A lack of love for yourself, a lack of love for others, a lack of love for everything that is given to us. The dictionary says that sin is a willful or deliberate violation of moral principle. Now your life is a complete unfolding of everything that you believe and everything that you take in. And you don't have to stay poor. Now, poor people are not bad people, and rich people are not good people, okay? There's all, there's the whole spectrum. But to stay stuck in that poverty thinking is really counterproductive to what God wants for us. Have you ever seen that thing or seen a bumper sticker and anyone ever sing this? I owe, I owe, so off to work I go, right? You owe, you owe. <laughs> you know, how about there's nothing certain except death and taxes, if you say so, okay? Life is a struggle. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world, you know? Some people were born with a silver spoon in their mouth. Some people crawled up through the sewers to get what they had, if you say so. Jesus didn't see it that way. Jesus was quite well off. Now, we've heard, the, the, you know, like the sweet little baby, and that, that song was written by Mahala Jackson, Jackson, sweet little baby child. And, you know, born, they made you be born in a manger, sweet little, you know, holy child. And they was, he was so poor. Well, let me clue you in. The reason he got born in Bethlehem in a manger, besides to fill the, fulfill the prophecy, is his parents, Joseph and Mary, were expecting a child. And he thought, Joseph thought that she would go into labor, but she didn't. So he took her and put her on the donkey, and they rode into Bethlehem. They did not have Hotels.com, so they <laughs> couldn't get a room. They had plenty of money. And why they were coming to Bethlehem is because they owed taxes. Why? Because Joseph had a business, and they owned land. Jesus was of the lineage of the King David, of, of the line of David. When he was born, it says that the wise men were signaled to look up in the sky, and they brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, I hope we have a chance at some point to talk about this. There weren't just three wise men, just so you know. And they didn't show up at the stable, just so you know. Okay? Okay. The, some of the religions uh, in the Middle East talk about 12 wise men, and they called them magi. Some of them were, they saw them as astrologers. They could read the signs in the heaven. And some of them were kings, we three kings. But, you know, the uh, Christian religion says, well, there were three wise men. No, there were three different gifts that they, that they brought. And they said that these wise men, or the magi, showed up up to two years later. Why do you think King Herod had the massacre of the innocent children, and he ordered that all male children under the age of two be killed because he was so threatened by Jesus? Okay? So, you know, we have to understand that things are not always what we think they are. But... Before you get all worked up about me being about prosperity, <laughs> believe me, I know what it's like to, to go without, okay? I know what it's like. And, you know, we, we were raised with manners in, in churches. And I was telling someone here this morning about how my dad was a spiritual seeker. Um, that's the nicest way I can put that. And he drug us from church to church to church. So we never knew what religion we were going to be, like from month to month. But it was all based on fear and guilt and shame and repenting and giving to others even if we didn't have it. I can remember one time he announced that we were going to be Jehovah's Witnesses until he found out we could not have a Christmas tree. <laughs> I mean, first things first, right? <laughs> That's not going to fly. But at age 39, our dad decided that he had had it with religion, 
and he left the church. He started smoking and drinking and running around. He left his wife, my mom, with six children. We lost the big house that they were renting. I mean, it wasn't a fancy house, it had four bedrooms. My mom had to move us into the projects. We had to go on government assistance. This was before the state would go after men. He never paid child support. We had to eat like powdered eggs, powdered milk, big things of meat, big things of cheese, and there was no money left over for anything. But what it did for me is it spurred me into action. I was like, I'm not living like this. And there has to be something better. And I began to understand that I am a child of God, and therefore I am not poverty stricken. And I am not going to stay stuck in that poverty. A lot of people hold up Mother Teresa as an example, you know, of Calcutta and her vow of chastity and poverty and all of that. Let me tell you something, Mother Teresa was not poor. That might shock you. But everywhere she, she had all of her needs met. Now she took care, do you think she could have taken care of all those poor people and the lepers and all of those people if she didn't have money? When she traveled, she went first class or she went in a private jet. She met and hobnobbed with kings and heads of states. Why? To get money for the poor people. She had influence. She oversaw a million dollar budget. I want you to just kind of recalibrate how you think about this. Jesus knew that we had everything given to us that we needed. But we had to participate and create. And I can tell you this, a lack of money and a belief in a lack of money is the cause of 95% of the crimes. Cartels, bank robberies, human trafficking, you know, thefts, all of this is, is rooted in the belief in a lack of money, in a lack of, I can't get what I want, so I'm gonna have to take it from somebody else. And if you have never struggled, struggled financially, you wouldn't know that. But I consider it a big blessing that not only did I get exposed to all of these religions, and not only did I get, uh, get a chance to see good people in action, but I was given the chance to learn that poverty is a cho choice. And I'm not saying that I chose to be born poor, but I'm telling you, it is a choice whether we're gonna stay stuck or if we're gonna rise up and help other people. If I didn't have enough, if I didn't have a car to get here, you think I'd be here today? Wouldn't be here today. So when you think about all of the misinformation that we have gotten about abundance and about sickness and about health and about opportunity and about choice. Jesus said, I come so that you may have life and have it more abundantly. Has anyone ever heard the story of Jesus cursing the fig tree? You wondered about that? It was barren. It was not giving fruit. And he knew that fig trees were supposed to be giving fruit. And he saw it as an example of humankind not living up to our potential. You see, acorns are supposed to grow into big oak trees. Caterpillars are supposed to turn into beautiful butterflies. And humans are supposed to access that godness, that allness, and be a difference and make a difference when I think about coming up, and I think theologians often miss the mark because they don't mind asking for money, but they don't want you to have it. <laughs> Sorry, just tell it like it is. You know, most people, in, in unity it's a little bit different. But you know, when you think about living abundantly, it is your birthright. And not only that, you are charged to live more abundantly. We are charged to step into that allness, that health, that wellness. 
you know, when people say to me, I mean, because we get to choose. I walk into a, into a store or something and people greet and I always greet them. And then when I get ready to leave, they go, have a nice day. And I always turn and say, I'm always one. And I hope you have one too. There is no hope that I'm going to have a nice day. I decided when I woke up, I opened two gifts. Those are my eyes. And I'm having a good day. So I'm going to talk about Jesus and the loaves and the fishes. Everyone has heard this thing, but many of you may not have heard why he was out on that hillside. So this is in Matthew chapter 14, and it goes through verses 13 through 21. But if you roll back toward the front of Matthew, what happened was King Herod was celebrating his birthday, and he had a big whoop de doo party. Good for him. I wish I could have been there. But his sister-in-law, who was his wife's sister, did this beautiful dance, and she, you know, was enthralled all of the, the guests there. And he was so enthralled, he made a statement, and he said, that is such a wonderful gift. He said, anything that you desire, I will be happy to give it to you. So she consulted with her sister, the queen, and she came back and said, I would like to have the head of John the Baptist given to me on a silver platter. Now, Herod wasn't really in favor of that, but he'd already made this statement and this promise, so that's what they did. And I want to read to you. It says, when Jesus heard what had happened, he found out that John the Beloved was, had been decapitated. It says, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. And hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. And when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, what did he say? Go away. Don't bug me. I just lost my favorite person here. No, he had compassion on them, and he began to heal the sick. And they gathered around to listen to him. And this went on for hours. And the disciples came to him and said, Master, it's getting late, and we should let these people go to, into these towns and get something to eat because, you know, they've been here a long time. And Jesus replied, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. And they said, we only have five loaves and two fishes. And he said, bring it to me, and we will feed them. And he blessed it. And they began to pass it out. And they said there were 5,000 men, plus women and children. There's no telling how big the, this group was. And they began to feed the multitude. And there was 12 baskets left over of broken bread and fish. Now, you tell me, is that wealthy? Right? If he had been in his whole thing, it's like, well, you know, I don't know what we're going to do. You know, I could eat five loaves and two fish my own self, you know. But no, no. He said, let me bless it. Let me multiply this. Let's feed these people. So he not only fed them spiritually and healed them, he fed them physically too. I want to talk about the very first recorded miracle in the Bible was when Jesus went to a wedding with his mother Mary. And the host ran out of wine. Calamity. I mean, it really was kind of a big deal. And Mary came to him, and she knew what Jesus was about. And there's a whole story of how she knew, because they studied with the Essenes and all of that. That's for another day. But she said, do something. And he said, bring, he told people, bring me some jugs of water. They brought it up. He blessed it, and it turned into the best wine. Not the wine that you serve after everyone's had wine. No, it was the best wine. And that was his first miracle. Do you recall when he himself had to pay taxes? Why? Because he and the disciples had a business. People gave them things. And so Herod was going to get his pound of flesh. Okay, he said, render under Caesar. That was just Caesar's. Render unto God. That was just God's. And they had to pay taxes, so he sent the disciples down, and one of them caught a fish, and he brought it up, and they opened the fish's mouth, and there was a gold coin there. Is that abundant? Pretty much. 
When Jesus was on the cross, the centurions were down below the cross casting lots. In other words, they were gambling to see who was going to get his seamless robes. He had the most expensive robes possible. They were made of one piece of cloth, one. And they knew that these things were, you know, they were really expensive. <coughs> Does that sound like poverty to you? He arrayed himself in the finest things as an example that the things that I do, you shall also do. When we are continually focused on everything we don't have, and we are continually saying, you know, oh, I just, you know, I'm, I'm so broke. You know, there's more month at the end of the money than there's money at the end of the month, right? Has anyone ever said stuff like that or heard someone that said it? Yeah, absolutely. So when you understand that we are here to exemplify the allness and the love and the healing and the abundance of, of Jesus to other people, then we are living as the example. We're always connected with the source. So you might ask, how can we live to our fullest abundant self and up to our potential? So I would like to ask you to ask yourself, what am I uniquely qualified to do or be? It might be something simple, like being helpful to someone, offering your attention and your prayers and your hearing to somebody who is suffering. It might be mowing somebody's lawn, making some cookies. Whatever it is, do that to the best of your ability. Focus on gratitude. What did Jesus do with the loaves and the fishes? He gave thanks, and then he broke the bread and the fishes. He gave thanks ahead of time. We don't give thanks after we get it. We give thanks before we get it. I always love the story about Lazarus. Lazarus and Jesus actually grew up together. They were friends, and when Jesus found out that Lazarus was sick, he was, going to, he was going to go to him. But he was told, no, wait. And he went, and Lazarus had already died. And he went to the sepulcher, and what did he do? Oh, woe is me, poor Lazarus. No. He looked up, and he said, I give thanks that you have heard me to God. And he said, Lazarus, come forth. And here comes Lazarus. I have a friend in Dallas who... <laughs> jokingly used to say, it's a good thing Jesus called him by name because all the other people would have jumped up out of the grave too. <laughs> <laughs> That's possible. <laughs> Live today like you respect yourself. And how does that work? Make sure that you have fresh, clean clothes on. They don't have to be perfect. They don't have to be designer stuff. But make sure that you are clean. Make sure your clothes are clean. Make sure your shoes are shined. Make sure that you get rid of the clutter in your house, in your car, in your office, in your mind, in your body. Ask yourself, is this worthy of me? Is this worthy of me? And if it's not worthy of you, don't do it. Don't have it. Get rid of it. I want you to speak words of affirmation and joy. I give thanks for this day. I give thanks, and I do. I'm so grateful to be here today. I'm so grateful to see all of you people. It lifts me up, and it makes me joyous. I want you to eat the best food you can possibly ingest and bless it ahead of time. Curly and photography has proven that blessed bread actually sparkles. It brings up the energy. That's why you bless your food. I tell my money game people, you know, it's hard to end up being a millionaire if you're always eating off of the dollar menu. You know, there's, and I'm not making fun of anybody who, you know, God knows I've scrounged out coins in the, in the couch before and <laughs> was glad to get a dollar hamburger. But you have to up your game. Put your food on a plate. Sit down. Take a deep breath. 
Give thanks. Look at the food. Smell it. Give thanks for it. Treat yourself as if you are worthy. Don't just hunch over the sink shoving, shoving food in your mouth. That's not worthy of you. Imagine that you are a child of God. How do you walk? How do you talk? How do you greet people? How do you eat? How do you live? And again, do not compare yourself with others. I was telling someone earlier that, and, and we'll talk about this in just a minute, but our women's retreat, my business partner is Cindy Jordan. And she wrote the Billboard number one hit song in 1983, Jose Cuervo, You Are a Friend of Mine. I know we've all heard that song. And she still gets royalties 40 years later. later. But she is a songwriter. She's written 19 books. She's written musicals. She's done several things. She's working on a brand new musical about spiritual awakening called The Beach. And I cannot be Cindy Jordan. I don't play the piano. You know, I don't write music. But you know, I can do this. I can speak. I can come. I can be, and I can give my energy to you. So don't look at other people saying, oh, look at her, look at him, you know. Look at everything they have, look at everything I don't have. You know, what you look at, you know, Wayne Dyer said it this way, when you see, when you change the, the way you see things, the things you see will change. Jesus had an abundant life and a mentality, and he assured us that we would do those things that he did if we would tap into that. So I'm here to encourage you today. I'm here to ask you to bless every penny that you have, every blessing. If someone gives you something or buys you a cup of coffee, say thank you and do it with gratitude. If you give something, my mother used to say, if, you, if someone asks you for something, give it quickly. Give it quickly. Don't go, well, let's see, what, what was it that you wanted me to do? What was that? Oh, okay, maybe. Well, you've just sucked all the life out of it, okay? I mean, you have. If you can do it, do it, and do it joyously. And then you give twice as much. So I'm going to leave you with this. This is uh, a statement from Dr. Jack Boland, who wrote uh, the, um, the whole course about masterminding. And we would always say this when we got ready to leave, uh, that after we'd shared our mastermind. Let's go forward with enthusiasm, enthusiasm, excitement, and expectancy. How about that? Enthusiasm, excitement, and expectancy, because we expect all good things, don't we? Thank you all for being here. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for being here for yourself. I love you. I bless you. And I behold the Christ in each and every one of you. Thank you so much. Reverend Jeannie, that was awesome. Thank you so much. If this is your first time at Unity, we're glad you're here. We hope that you are finding a place of like-minded people and a place to belong. We teach spiritual tools that can help you no matter what is going on in your life. If you are interested in a welcome packet, an usher can bring you one or you can grab one on your way out. Please fill out the contact form if you wish to be a part of our weekly email newsletter. We now have an opportunity to support our spiritual cooperative. If you would like to donate by credit card, go to our website, unityhillcountry.org, and click on the Donate button, or, or scan the QR code on your handouts. Please consider setting up an automatic monthly contribution. If you would prefer to mail us checks, please mail them to 1016 Jefferson Street, Kerrville, Texas, 
78028. And we thank you in advance for your generosity. Please bless what you are giving now and join me in our offering affirmation together. Divine love, as me, blesses and multiplies all that I am, all that I give, and all that I receive. I send it forth with my blessings and my love. Was nice we like i like that uh blessing our abundance uh, we open our hearts in gratitude as we release these donations we send these gifts forward through our congregation and into our world blessing all that it affects thank you community announcements the ladies clothing exchange is coming up this week again next saturday um the 24th from eight to four Donation drop-off and uh, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Thursday and Friday. Uh, please take a flyer out front with all the clothing exchange information. Does anybody else have anything to say before we close up? Yes, ma'am. Um, we're having, for the folks out on Facebook, um, a fall festival on September 28th. And if you're interested in selling um, to rent a table, let um, Francis Osborne know. I'm sorry, I, I, why I lose your name. <sighs> oh, sure. Okay. So out here on the, on the table we have, and sorry guys, you're not invited. So, <laughs> no Y chromosome, sorry about that. But we're having our eighth annual Beautiful Network of Women, Women's Retreat, Thursday through Sunday, September 19th through the 22nd. And uh, it's called, this one is themed, It's About Time. And it really is just about time for us to get together. We're going to be right on the Lano River, the South Lano River, which is fed by 700 living springs. Yeah, and we've got just wonderful things. But I've got to tell you, we also have got some day passes. So you can come stay with us. We, we have beautiful, lovely cabins. And um, once you get to know me better, you know I don't camp, okay? So if, I, if you call seeing the park you know, from your hotel room, that's me. Um, but <laughs> that's camping. But these are beautiful, beautiful cabins. And they're fully furnished, and they're wonderful. But we also have uh, one and two day passes if you just want to come out on Friday or Saturday. Everything is available to you, all of the food, all of the speakers, all of the events. We have dancing. We've got all kinds of fun things. Just go see us on beautifulnetworkofwomen.com and sign up there. My phone number is down here if you want to call me or text me. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, this is Abundance Sunday, so please stick around and have lunch with us. Um, we always have plenty of food, so please stay. Um, we've reached the end of our gathering. Please circle, rise, circle, and join hands, and we'll do the peace song and our prayer for protection.